I don't like talking about myself, but my name well. is Tamar Davis. I'm from the amazing city of Houston, Texas. And I'm born and raised in Houston. I am the only girl in a family of five of us. It's two boys, and then my mom and my daddy. Um, went to high school for the performing and visual arts, and then moved on to Los Angeles to go to University of Southern California, where I got my Bachelor of Music and Music Business. And life took off from there. How long have you been singing? I've been singing since I was three. And it's crazy because I remember when I was singing. I was Dorothy and the Wiz. And I went to Southmore Kitty College. Shout out to Southmore. It's still there. And Mr. Reinhardt, the late Mr. Reinhardt, um, who was over the music department at Texas Southern University, actually had me, uh, well, he asked the class, you know, who would want to sing home? And my mother tells the best story. They said I just shot my hand up in the air, and my parents were like, they had never heard me sing. I didn't know I could sing, but my mother had heard me hum a lot. And so um, they said the day I sang home, they were just like, I got to stand in ovation. And from there, I started singing in church. So having a platform is nothing new to you? No, it's nothing new for me. But I wasn't the typical girl like where I would be at home and like, hey, look at me sing. Like, I made pots and pans my own classroom. Like, I wanted to be a teacher. So like, I, my imagination was all I needed, you know? My brother's 11 months younger than me, so I, I had him sometimes. I kind of manipulated him into playing with me, but I wouldn't play with him. But he would play with me in my imaginary, t you know, world, and um, that's how I, uh, I entertained myself. Very well. Now, you also <laughs> went on to sing with another popular group here in Houston. Right. The People's Choice Awards was here. Was it the People's Choice Awards? Yes. Mm -hmm. the, the People's Choice Awards was here when I was little. It was like the thing to do. I was in one competition. Beyonce was in another um, category. And I remember afterwards, there was a gala. I remember the room, and she and I were laughing and joking, and our parents were over at another table, and come to find out, lo and behold, there was a group being formed, or there was a group that was formed. I can't remember which way. And I auditioned for the group, and the group was called Girls Time at the time, now known as Destiny's Child. Um, and at the time, it was six of us. It was me, Beyonce, Kelly, and then Latavia, Nikki, and Nina. Very, very well. So from that, to the voice. Let's talk about it. You've also done a lot of stuff in between. I, I want people to know in Houston what you've done because you didn't just stop at girls time and no. it didn't just begin at the voice. No, so kind of bring me through those years. In between the time of girls time and the voice, I mean it was a lot. I went to HSPBA like I said. I ended up getting the Presidential Scholar Awards and that was for the National Foundation for the Advancement in the Arts where I was blessed to sing at the Kennedy Center. Um, beat out like over 8,000 applicants because you had to have good grades, of course, and then you also had to be in the arts. Um, and so I got a gold medallion from former President Bill Clinton. Um, and from there, I just kept doing pageants and competitions, and then I went to USC in LA, and I started doing demo work with Shep Crawford. Shep Crawford is the infamous composer of Whitney Houston hits, Deborah Cox hits, Tamia hits, Enrique Iglesias. I mean, he was, he is the guy. And I remember sitting next to him, and he was just kind of like, you know, would you like to sing background for Tamia? There's an audition. And I was like, I never thought in a million years I would ever sing background. Like, I, I did not grow up saying, I want to tour, I want to, you know, I, I didn't. And I kind of looked at him and I was like, okay. He was like, well, it's today. And I was like, okay. And I went to the audition, ended up booking that opportunity on the spot. But it was for the Verizon, Verizon First Ladies Tour, and Beyonce was the headliner. And I remember in my mind, I was thinking, what am I going to do when I see her? And so that tour was about two months, three months. I can't even remember. Gosh, it was in 2004. Fatima Robinson, who was a choreographer for Michael Jackson, okay. you name it, um, stayed in touch. We stayed in touch. And she was a choreographer for that concert, for the Tamiya tour. And so long story short, um, one day she asked me to come down to a video shoot. And it was at this big mansion in the hills in, in LA. And it was like 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning. Four o'clock in the morning rolls around. And they're like, okay, we need everyone to come in and let's do this shoot. And we go in in literally seconds. They were like, all right, that's a wrap. And you're like, well, we didn't do anything. And lo and behold, like I promise you, I felt this presence like go behind me. I'll never forget it. And I looked around and it was Prince. Mm -hmm. And so that night they took a picture of everyone that was there, the extras, and I got a call on Friday night to come back to his house for an after party for the People's Choice Awards. What was so weird was that 
hardly no one else got a call. So I was like, okay, is this a setup? And I remember telling my mom, like, mom, can you go with me? And she's afraid of heights. So as we got closer and closer to the house, she just wasn't wanting, you know, she didn't want to get high up in the skies. Mm -hmm. So we turned around and one of my mentors came with me and accompanied me to the party. And I walked up to Prince and I introduced myself. And I was like, I'm Tamar, you recorded a song for me when I was 11. And he was like, what? And I was like, somewhere over the rainbow. He was like, oh, how are you? History was made. Literally. Wow. Um, that's that story. Mm -hmm. I, Wait, what did you go on to do with him? Oh, that that's yeah. a whole nother five but, hours. No, ready? but you can give me oh, a okay. quick. I did this All with right. Prince. So I want to hear Prince, um, so that night, it was the sun was literally coming up, and I was singing in his studio, and we were just jamming. He was playing guitar. My friend was, like, on keys, and I just was coming up with songs at the top of my head. He was like, you can come up here and record any time. And I was like, I can't just come knock on your door and come record. And a month later, I got a call from his assistant, Ruth, and I was in his house band with Frank McComb on keys. If you know anything about music, the Frank McComb was on keys. Cora from Houston and her husband were in the band. And next thing you know, we were a house band. And he didn't even have an idea what was going to happen. I didn't either. A month rolls by. He's like, hey, Tamar, um, can you come to Minneapolis? Not knowing, but Prince is asking you to come to Minneapolis. You're going to go. Go to Minneapolis, and we're just recording. But he didn't know he was going to record an album. I didn't know I was going to record an album. It just kind of happened. Like, it was literally pure, like, on a whim, literally. Months roll by. He's like, do you want to record an album? I said, yes. Months roll by. We end up writing Beautiful, Loved, and Blessed. We end up going on an 11-city tour. Beautiful, Loved, and Blessed is a Grammy-nominated song um, in 2007 for Best Duet. And we go on an 11-city tour. Some of the shows sold out in seconds. Um, people thought I was Tamar Braxton. And and on the radio, you would hear people saying, like, no, this is a totally new girl with big hair and curves. You've got to go hear her. She's the chocolate girl. And that's when it hit me to start doing research. Like, why were people calling me the chocolate girl? And I didn't know Prince had protégés that were fair skin, mm -hmm. And I didn't know what a protégé was. And come to find out, tabloids were saying she's a protégé. Long story short, it was Tamar featuring Prince. He was on guitar. He kept telling everyone, I mean, even Shaka Khan, I remember him having a conversation and he was like, I'm just her guitar player. And he would tell everyone that. And it was just, I don't even think it's really hit me, like how much this. That, that's going to be my question. Like, yeah. what does that feel like? That's an amazing moment. Those are. Well, when you're in the moment, yeah. you no one can tell you what was going through your head. I do know for a fact, like, I was really treating him as Uncle Prince. Like, he became a part of our family. He called my mother, you know, Aunt Carolyn. You know, he flew my father in, and we had a private performance for my dad. Like, it was just, thinking back gets me emotional because it's like, who would have thought? Who would have thought? You know, he came to my brother's baseball, basketball tournament and flew to San Diego. Uh, one of my favorite stories of all time was, it hit me when I was working with him. I... I guess I would say I introduced Prince to Tyler Perry DVDs, and so um, <laughs> this is how much fun we had. So I was like, here, you got to pop these DVDs in, to the point where he would just be laughing hysterical on the floor. So one day he says, Tamar, after rehearsal, we're going to go somewhere, bring something nice, and his surprise to me was Medea Goes to Jail. And I had never seen Mr. Perry uh, live and in person. And what was so eerie about that day, which is a good thing, was when the curtains opened up, Cassie Davis and LeVan Davis, who are now on House of Pain, I started a performance with them. Oh my God, this is bringing back memories. In a 99-seat theater in Los Angeles, we weren't making a dime. And I remember we performed as if it was a million people out there. And I remember seeing them on this big stage in the Kodak Theater, like, and I'm looking at Prince, I'm like, that's Cassie, that's LeVan. He's like, who? He's like, calm down. He's like, matter of fact, scoot over a seat. He was like, because you are just too loud. So I, I moved over a seat, and it's a Prince, an empty seat, me, an empty seat, Shaka Khan. So I'm like, where am I? Out comes Tyler Perry as Medea, and I'm like, <gasps> and I look at him, and I'm like, that's Tyler. He's like, I know, be quiet. And I was like, okay. So anyways, he gets to this moment in the show. You, if you've never seen a Tyler Perry play, you've got to know his motif is taking it back to old school music. Mm -hmm. And he's playing all these hits, and he's like, he's in his Tyler Perry voice as Medea, very weird. And next thing you know, he's like, yeah, but no song tops this song. And he strums the chords to Purple Rain. 
And I was like, that's Purple Rain. And then you see someone passing a mic to Prince, and I'm like, and he does it again. And Prince is like, never meant to cause you any sorrow. I cried. I lost it. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. And he gets up, he sits next to me, and at the chorus, we sing Purple Rain. Whoa. And that's when I was like, I'm working with Prince. Yeah. That's huge. <laughs> oh, great stories. Great stories. <laughs> And then that's, I mean, it's that's how like met the Tyler voice now is like just this little show now. I know, it's like, oh my God. Okay, so tell me now, bring me up to date, up to speed, The Voice. Tamar. Well, The Voice, I can't even talk about The Voice without bringing up Mr. Perry. And right, because you end up working for him. Working right. With, okay, go ahead. And this is, you know, this is KPRC Houston, so I have to be honest. My attorney actually helped me get an audition the very first time, and it was an epic hashtag fail did not go through it all. Epic hashtag film. How so? <laughs> like, I just, I, I didn't make it. Like, I didn't even get past the audition. Like, they were just like, oh, not this time. And I was just like, crap. And I remember telling my mom, like, see, this is why I don't do these competitions, you know? And um, so long story short, um, in 2012, Mr. Perry was just like, you've got to audition for The Voice. And I just kept saying, I, I just, no, I can't. He kept saying, you got to audition, you got to audition, you got to audition. And I was like, no, 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 no. And finally, it happened. I, um, I auditioned in New York. I moved on. And like, I never want to look back. This opportunity has just changed my life. Like, every day is a learning process, new music. It's just great. I mean, um, and now it's the voice. It's the voice. Like, I, I don't even know how to put into words this, the opportunity, the vocal coaching. You know, just when you think you couldn't grow, you're growing like leaps and bounds. You're meeting new people. You're sharing, la it feels like a whole nother high school opportunity. It's just the most jaw-dropping, jaw-dropping experience. And it's pretty cool because people are looking at me like, you've worked with Prince, and I'm looking at them like, yeah, but this is the voice, you know? Who, tell the people who you're working with and why you chose that person and why it's so important to you? Uh, Christina Aguilera. I'm working with Christina Aguilera. I don't even know what's going to happen, you know, with this next, I don't know, like it's Christina Aguilera. You look at her and you're like, oh wow, it's Christina Aguilera. But then when you do the research, because you have, I'm going to be honest, like I know Fighter, I know, you know, Hurt, I know Jeannie Nabato, but you don't really know the person until like you do some more research and you sift through the things that they've yet to really share. And she has just been so encouraging. You know, she gets me, she gets my big hair, she gets my style, she gets my tone, she gets that I am different, not because I want to be, it's just who I am. It's, I guess, is how God just formed me, how my parents have honed. She sees that I don't have to try to be anything. She allows me to be Tamar. Um, so I'm going to see what happens now because I, I don't know what to expect. I'm just excited. Like, I really am excited. I don't even like coming. Yeah, I just, I'm just excited. Perfect world. <laughs> what happens for Tamar Davis next? Perfect world. What happens for me is to not have to feel like I'm grinding anymore. I think that's the best way to put it. Like, I don't, I don't want to think for myself for a minute. I mean, it sounds so weird, but as an independent artist, you're always the one thinking of how to get ahead, um, not to be the trending topic, but to find out how you not only fit, but how you don't fit and how it, it's supposed to fit, whatever you bring to the table. I've been working on my second album since 2009, and... It would just be amazing to hear my song on the radio. It would be great to headline my own tour, whether it's just at all the House of Blues or all, you know, arenas. It doesn't matter to me. I feel like for me to see my parents on the front row and see this, this all that they've sacrificed, like, that is next for Tamar, honestly. Um, yeah, I, I, I honestly do. I, I'm a part of, I created the Tamar Davis Academy. I love going into schools and challenging them about the industry, what jobs are out there. It's not just about being on stage. There are jobs behind the camera. There's wardrobe. There's designers. There's 
there's wig designers, there's, I mean, there's carpenters. Mm -hmm. It's just been mind-blowing to find young talent. I, I love that. Like, if I could start putting out music and projects on them, being an entrepreneur in an st artistic startup company is something that I desire to do eventually. Um, and I'll always be singing. But I feel like I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a mogul in the making, and I didn't even know it. You know what I mean? Um, and that's really it. Honestly. <laughs> I love it. I'm, I'm yeah. yeah. And I love being in Houston. I, I didn't realize how much Houston is where I want to be. I want to be closer to my family and to be able to launch that academy. Right. We did a teen summit. My parents and I did a teen summit in 2013 during NBA All-Star. That just brought me so much joy. Like, I didn't get any sleep, but I loved not getting any sleep. I loved seeing, you know, Minute Maid sponsors and it, it was just and my mother used her connections at Houston Community College that's where my advocacy for education came from that's very important in our family not because it's like a cliche thing but nothing has really infected us by God's grace when it comes to anything else outside of education honestly and so I'm excited I'm so excited it, to win the voice and be able to take that platform and go and create and be able to like call someone and they're not like who what oh, okay well, we'll Google her. Like, it'll be like, oh, Tamar Davis, yes, we would love, you know, don't give me a dime. If I could see this academy flourish mm -hmm. in my city, that's all that matters. It